The term feminism, as we use it today, first appeared in the 1837 work of the utopian socialist Charles Fourier. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as advocacy of the rights of women based on the theory of equality of the sexes. In this episode, we're exploring the idea that this feminism has been misnamed. We're going to be distinguishing between true feminism and the historical woman's movement which we'll be calling womanism. This new feminism will be a movement centred not on the female sex, but on the feminine itself and on the currently disregarded values of femininity. This ties in with our recent exploration of the four domains of human experience, in particular the third quadrant, the domain of the internal collective, the ocean of collective psyche that limits and shapes every individual consciousness in a given culture. This is the realm of the worldviews and value systems that shape the mass psychology of a culture. This ties in with the broadest concerns of thinkers like Nietzsche, Jung and Foucault, this redefinition of the term feminism points to a Nietzschean revaluation of all values and a deep shift in the way we relate to our existence. First thing to establish then is what we mean by femininity as distinct from the female sex and who better to speak about such things than a straight white male. The world needs a reaction from a white guy like me. Bingo. Who is healing the world with philosophy. The idea that femininity and masculinity can be separated from their associated sexes is an idea that has a long history in Chinese philosophy, with the dynamic forces of yin and yang representing these abstracted masculine and feminine principles at least as far back as the school of naturalists in the 3rd century BC. It's also something that is intuitively grasped in language. In the English language, we have words like effeminate and mannish that have long been applied to people who do not fit the gender role stereotypes of their culture. There are some men who are more feminine than many women, and some women that are more masculine than many men. And while masculinity and femininity are obviously more correlated with their connected sexes, every person has some admixture of both in their psyche. The BEM sex role inventory, or BSRI, is a tool that has been used for the study of gender role perceptions in the social sciences since its development by American psychologist Sandra BEM in the 1970s. The inventory asks subjects to rate themselves between 1 and 5 on a number of traits. These traits are divided up into three categories, feminine, masculine and neutral. Based on the responses, the BSRI determines the masculinity and femininity of a particular individual. As we might expect, the BSRI has come under some scrutiny in the 21st century, but it still stands as an effective diagnostic tool in the study of gender roles, and so it's not a bad place to distinguish between masculine and feminine traits. On the BSRI, we find the following traits associated with masculinity. Assertive, analytical, willing to take risks, dominant, acts as a leader, individualistic, competitive, ambitious, and the following traits associated with femininity, yielding, cheerful, shy, affectionate, compassionate, soft-spoken, gullible, loves children. Another way of looking at these differences comes from the work of the human behaviour researcher Helen Fisher, who studied the correlation between neurochemicals and character traits. The two relevant profiles for our purposes are the male sex hormone testosterone and the female sex hormones the oestrogens. In this research we find the following traits associated with the female sex hormones. People who are expressive of the oestrogen system tend to be intuitive, introspective, holistic, imaginative, trusting, empathetic and contextual long-term thinkers. They are sensitive to people's feelings and typically have good verbal and social skills. These people are negotiators. They're big picture thinkers, tolerate ambiguity well, have mental flexibility and strong executive social skills. They're highly emotionally intelligent. While under testosterone we find the following. People expressive of the testosterone system are tough-minded, direct, decisive, skeptical, competitive, emotionally contained, inventive, experimental, exacting, analytical and assertive. They tend to be good at rule-based systems engineering, computers, mechanics, math, and music. Now that we've put together a picture of what we mean by the feminine, let's talk about a new formulation of feminism. 
In essence, I'm suggesting that 20th century women have been living for centuries in a male-oriented culture, which has kept them unconscious of their own feminine principle. Now, in their attempt to find their own place in a masculine world, they have unknowingly accepted male values. Goal-oriented lives, compulsive drivenness, and concrete bread which fails to nourish their feminine mystery. Marion Woodman, the owl was a baker's daughter. Having established what masculinity and femininity look like at the individual level, it's time to look at the same distinction from the perspective of the collective. And when you look at the collective side of our industrialized culture through the lens of the masculine and the feminine, it becomes patently obvious that we live in a hyper-masculinized society. The cluster of traits that industrialized society selects for, whether that's the capitalist society of the West or socialist societies like China and the USSR, are the traits associated with masculinity. In the values landscape of industrial society, it is masculine values that dominate. This is the general direction that the term patriarchy is pointed in. The trouble with the term patriarchy is that it runs into the same problem of conflating men and masculinity and females and femininity. The Oxford Dictionary defines patriarchy as a society, system or country that is ruled or controlled by men. In a masculine values landscape, it is inevitable that on average men will come out on top. While both men and women partake of masculinity and femininity, at scale masculine traits are more correlated with males and feminine traits are more correlated with females. As such, in a landscape that is organized according to masculine values, men have a statistical advantage and are more likely by the setup of the landscape to come out on top. Historically, the women's movement has sought to overcome this. The basis for this movement has been the idea of the equality of the sexes. The womanist movement felt that women were being kept out of the workplace and places of power because of historical oppression. The direction of this oppression was seen to be men over women, but this, as we are arguing here, merely obscures the real depth and nature of the problem. All of this brings us to the real crux of the argument. The historical movement that we call feminism has not actually been feminism at all. This historical movement that in this episode we're calling womanism achieved a big shift in the organization of society, but not in the collective value system. Womanism brought women more and more into the masculine value system. The integration of women into the masculine value sphere was the ultimate victory for what we might call masculinism. Looking back at the traits associated with femininity in the BSRI, we find the following terms. Yielding, compassionate, tender, soft-spoken and children-loving. These traits don't bring to mind coders and Google, Fortune 500 CEOs or Wall Street bankers. I'm not a cat. Those top paid job descriptions are more intuitively connected with masculine traits like assertive, analytical, willing to take risks, dominant, aggressive, competitive, and ambitious. By framing it as a problem of women versus men, womanism unwittingly validated the culture's value distribution. It affirmed the value of competitiveness, of ambition, and of dominance. And it argued that women are just as competent in these traits as men. And so what womanism ended up doing was initiating women into a masculinist value structure, a landscape where their gender correlated traits are punished rather than rewarded. The post-womanist world has never been so masculinist. Sure, a few more of those with power and influence are women, but the value structure is exactly the same. Womanism consummated industrial society's apotheosis of masculine values while putting the final nail in the coffin of feminine values. The entire thrust of womanism ended up being not a revaluation of the feminine, but an initiation of women into a masculine paradigm. What has historically been called feminism is thus, ironically, a masculinist movement. Rather than weakening the competitive dominance paradigm of masculinism, it concretized it. Nothing has done more to devalue the feminine than so-called feminism. But, we should hastily add, there was no other option. There was no way the women's movement could have brought about a revaluation of the feminine, given the lack of power that women had. And it was unlikely to be instigated by men, given the cultural perceptions of women's inferiority. Perhaps then the revaluation of the feminine could be more accurately portrayed as the consummation of womanism 
as a new wave in the movement where, as women got more power, they could work towards a revaluation of the value system itself. This is in fact exactly what happened. In the 1980s and 90s, the equality versus difference debate was a major battleground in the women's movement. Ultimately, however, the equality camp who argued for the similarities between men and women won out, and so-called difference feminism fell out of all favour. And so, rather than affirming the value of feminine traits, rather than valorising care, community, cooperation and connection, womanism abandoned feminine values. And so, we live in a society that has become completely imbalanced towards one way of viewing the world, the masculinist value structure. Unsurprisingly, the total dominance of the masculinist value structure has quickly led to cracks appearing in the foundations of society. In his 2002 work, Authentic Happiness, the father of positive psychology, Martin Seligman, noted that mounting over the last 40 years in every wealthy country on the globe, there has been a startling increase in depression. Depression is now 10 times as prevalent as it was in 1960, and it strikes at a much younger age. The mean age of a person's first episode of depression 40 years ago was 29 and a half, while today it is 14 and a half years. This is a paradox since every objective indicator of well-being, purchasing power, amount of education, availability of music and nutrition has been going north, while every indicator of subjective well-being has been going south. How is this epidemic to be explained? The productivity and hard work that have led to this improvement in material conditions have been paid for by an increasing disregard for the feminine. And in the two decades since Seligman's work was published, the situation has only gone from bad to worse, exacerbated as it has been by the advent of the age of social media. The reactionary will respond to this by talking about the decline in family values. This discourse contains a nostalgia for the good old days when men went out and worked and women stayed at home. That is one way of viewing the revaluation, but it is probably the least imaginative. The thing is, the masculine and feminine were far from being balanced in that arrangement. The denigration of the feminine didn't start in the 20th century. It started somewhere close to 10,000 years ago with the redistribution of power in the culture as agricultural societies replaced horticultural societies. At that time, we can see the shift in the pantheons of such cultures, from great mother cultures to the more patriarchal religions that we are familiar with. The feminine has been on the back foot for a very, very long time. The last half of the 20th century has merely been the final straw in a slow but steady process. The mental health crisis isn't the only major symptom of this nadir of the feminine. The links to the ecological crisis are obvious, and one could also argue that the meaning crisis could be seen as the consummation of centuries of de-emphasis on the feminine. Masculine values have taken such precedence in their striving upward that the earth and this life have lost all their meaning. The sense of embodied meaning and connection to the world around us has been lost in the desensitised realm of the masculine until we have been left treading water in the nihilistic void. In this sense, Nietzsche's Dionysian revaluation of all values can be seen as a feminine revaluation. It's an affirmation of the joys and tribulations of life as they are, and a recognition of the sacredness of the world as it is, rather than needing to apply a metaphysical filter to make it more appealing. The revaluation of the feminine isn't a return to Victorian values. The man at work slash woman at home structure of pre-womanism was still appallingly imbalanced. Of course, that begs the question, what would a post-industrial feminist society look like? What would it look like if society valued the masculine and the feminine equally? Or to completely flip it, can we imagine what a society would look like that was as imbalanced towards feminism as ours is towards masculinism? These are the questions of a new breed of feminism, one that is tied not to sex, but to the broader value systems of the masculine and the feminine. Looking through the lens of this distinction, you can already identify a number of individuals and schools out there that are operating out of what we might call a feminist paradigm. You can see elements of it in the school of ecofeminism, in the work of people like Charles Eisenstein, Brene Brown, and alternative economists like Jason Hickel and Blair Fix. These different intellectual threads are working at forming alternatives to our collective value system. The more communitarian, compassionate and yielding feminine values 
might just find their hour as the consequences of the imbalanced masculine value system come to full fruition. True feminism wouldn't simply be about paying nurses as much as CEOs or of changing societal attitudes towards being a stay-at-home parent. The revaluation of the feminine is a shift that would completely reorient our entire globalized ecosystem. It's nothing short of a Nietzsche revaluation of all values. Now, what that revaluation would look like and how that would be achieved is obviously beyond the scope of this video, but I hope you found the idea thought-provoking. That's everything for this episode of The Living Philosophy. I'd like to thank Shane, Croissant Eater, and all the other patrons for their incredible support. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up down below. And if you really enjoyed it, you might want to head over to Patreon where you can get access to monthly Q&As. I'm planning on putting up uh, short episodes there that will not be on YouTube. And obviously you can get your name in the credits like these wonderful people. And uh, yeah, as ever, if you have any thoughts, insights or feedback, love to hear from you down in the comments. Otherwise, I should see you next time. Thank you for watching.